37th church anniversary. Congratulations. Um, I serve as a half-time associate pastor in Minocqua, Wisconsin at Ascension Lutheran Church. And I grew up here. I was baptized here, confirmed here, and um, it's a special place to be. So thank you for having me here today. Um, after uh, worship today is, our, is your mortgage burning, which I believe happens outside. And there'll be somebody talking more about that after, as well as refreshments um, and cake, I think. So please stay for that. Um, at this time, do we have any other announcements? two truckloads and then some to get them all hauled away. They were going to Handbags for Hope, to uh, domestic abuse centers, and uh, homeless shelters in the Green Bay vicinity. So they're also looking for personal care products as well. A big thank you to the congregation members who uh, brought in between the personal care kits we did earlier this spring and the school kit items uh, this fall now that we've collected. We'll be putting that all together and I'll have numbers next week as to how many we gathered of everything. Also, to the ladies who did quilting, we've got a lot of quilt, quilts back there. Um, let's see, what else have I got here? <laughs> uh, Welka, the women of the church. Bible study will start up the end of October. I'll have a date in the newsletter. And this is for all confirmed ladies of the congregation. So plan for that. Um, in your September, October issue, the second lesson will be the one we'll be doing. So, And if you need to order... I have the postcards here. Um, also, choir members. We'd like to get the choir back up and running. So Kathy Bader is willing to come in. Kathy Brown will be our pianist. And it looks like Wednesdays will be the best date. I'll find out a time from Kathy Bader what time that will be. But probably not in this week Wednesday, probably next week Wednesday. Thank you. Would you please rise? The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. We gather in the name of God the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Lord let us pray. Generous God, your Son gave his life that we might come to peace with you. Give us a share of your Spirit, and in all we do, empower us to bear the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning. Today we have a reading from Numbers for our chapter 11. The rabble among them had a strong craving, and the Israelites also wept again and said, if only we had meat to eat. We remember the fish we used to eat in Egypt for nothing, the cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, and the garlic. 
but now our strength is dried up and there is nothing at all but this manna to look at. Moses heard the people weeping throughout their families, all at the entrances of their tents. Then the Lord became very angry and Moses was displeased. So Moses said to the Lord, why have you treated your servants so badly? Why have I not found favor in your sight that you lay this burden of all this people on me? Did I conceive all this people? Did I give birth to them that you should say to me, carry them in your bosom as a nurse carries a sucking child to the land that you promised on oath to their ancestors? Where am I to get meat to give to all this people? For they come weeping to me and say, give us meat to eat. I am not able to carry all this people alone for they are too heavy for me. If this is the way you are going to treat me, put me to death at once, if I have found favor in your sight, and do not let me see my misery. So the Lord said to Moses, Gather for me seventy of the elders of Israel, whom you know to be the elders of the people and officers over them. Bring them to the tent of meeting, and have them take their place there with you. So Moses went out and told the people the words of the Lord, and he gathered 70 elders of the people and placed them all around the tent. Then the Lord came down in the cloud and spoke to him and took some of the spirit that was on him and put it on the 70 elders. And when the spirit rested upon them, they prophesied, but they did not do so again. Two men remained in the camp, one named Eldad and the other named Medad and the spirit rested on them. They were among those registered, but they had not gone out to the tent, and so they prophesied in the camp. And a young man ran and told Moses, Eldad and Medad are prophesying in the camp, and Joshua, son of Nun, the assistant of Moses, one of his chosen men said, My Lord Moses, stop them. But Moses said to him, are you jealous for my sake? Would that all the Lord's people were prophets and that the Lord would put his spirit in on them. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please rise, unless there's special music. Okay, please be seated. <laughs> Excuse me.
please rise. Gospel according to St. Mark. Glory to you, O Lord. John said to Jesus, Teacher, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to stop him, because he was not following us. But Jesus said, Do not stop him, for no one who does a deed of power in my name will be able soon afterward to speak evil of me. Whoever is not against us is for us. For truly I tell you, whoever gives you a cup of water to drink because you bear the name of Christ will by no means lose the reward. If any of you put a stumbling block before one of these little ones who believe in me, it would be better for you if a great millstone were hung around your neck and you were thrown into the sea. If your hand causes you to stumble, Cut it off. It is better for you to enter life maimed than to have two hands and go to hell, to the unquenchable fire. And if your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life lame than to have two feet to be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to stumble, tear it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than to have two eyes and to be thrown into hell where their worm never dies and the fire is never quenched. For everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good, but if salt has lost its saltiness, how can you season it? Have salt in yourselves and, and be at peace with one another. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated. Going for walks outside is one of my favorite things to do, and it's even better when I'm with family. And of course, right now, during fall, it's even more fun to see the edges of the green trees turn tinges of yellow and orange and red, and to feel that crisp, cool air on my face. But in addition to that refreshing beauty, going for walks helps clear my head, and it gives me focus and satisfaction knowing that 20 or 30 minutes of exercise is well worth my time. It's a great way to start the day, and, but some mornings I wake up early and I'm not quite thinking straight yet, or I'm not sure what to do with myself, so I just sit at the edge of my bed and stare at the carpet. And my husband, Grant, says, do you want to go for a walk? And I usually say yes, and then I get up with purpose and drive, because now I know what to do with myself. It's best if I don't spend too much time thinking. Just put on the shoes and walk in the pajamas. Don't get distracted. Just go. So my husband and I usually get a good amount of time talking. We stretch our legs out on the road near our home. And later after the walk, he usually says, thanks for the walk. And I usually say, I wouldn't have done it without you. Because that's true. <laughs> I probably wouldn't have had the motivation to get up and do that right away in the morning. So I'm thankful for the invitations. Going for walks, especially in the fall, really puts a rhythm to the day. And I realize if I do go for walks by myself later, I'm really not by myself. And I don't mean because I have a couple dogs with me usually in the afternoon, but I'm not really by myself because when I walk, I find myself praying to God. So really, I'm not alone. I'm often walking and spending time with Jesus in nature. The disciples were going for a walk with Jesus in last week's gospel reading. And just to quickly review, Jesus and his disciples were walking through the region of Galilee to Capernaum. And on the way, the disciples had been arguing about who was the greatest disciple. When they finished their walk and went into a house to sit down, Jesus said to them, whoever wants to be first must be last and servant. And Jesus took a child in his arms and said, Whoever welcomes um, such a child in my name welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes not me, but the one who sent me. Which takes us to today's gospel reading, which is still a part of that same post-walk discussion. 
in which Jesus' disciples were concerned about this other new guy preaching or casting out demons in Jesus' name. Somebody outside of their little close group of disciples, somebody different. So they tried to stop this person. And Jesus instructs them, saying not to stop him. This man wasn't working against them. He was on the same team as them, per se. And Jesus goes on to explain to his disciples, using an icky metaphor about cutting off a hand or foot or eye, about how serious they need to be in their discipleship, about not causing others or stopping others from their work, about not causing others to stumble and lose faith. The phrase, cause to stumble, in our text today comes from the Greek word scandalizo or scandalize, which means a loss of faith. Jesus also uses the metaphor of having salt in themselves, to be, is, and that is good to have salt, but if, it, if you've lost your saltiness, how can you season it again? What is that supposed to mean? How is that for a confusing post-walk discussion with their teacher? Today's Bible text is one of those Bible verses that can really mess with your brain. And if you don't take time to stop and think about it closely, or in my case, do a little extra research and a commentary to figure out some of its weirdness, you can really get thrown off by that gruesome body part metaphor in today's Gospel reading. And you could miss out what the Jesus is trying to teach us in the first place. If I had to try and summarize what today's big idea is, I would say Jesus is directing his disciples not to be so concerned about how other people are doing their work. Rather, each disciple is to be more concerned about not stumbling in their own work that they have. It's not other people who might be different that they should be concerned about. We need to get serious and watch out for what we ourselves are doing in our own work, in our own faith walk with Jesus. The true opposition isn't necessarily others, even though that's where most of our church squabbles happens, right? When we don't like what each other's methods are. Our true opposition in our faith walk is found within ourselves, in the sin that can rise up from inside, And what temptations could lead us astray from that path we're walking with Jesus? The other day, my family and I were near a boat ramp in Minocqua, and we had that had several wooden piers protruding from the shoreline for boats to come in to tie up to if they needed. And the piers alternated between the normal ones that are about this wide with planks and other um, other ones that were just a four by four beam out onto the water to separate the boats um, on the pylons. And so these narrow ones were like big giant gymnastic beams, right? 20 feet out, a gymnastic beam that was about 20 feet out into the water. Well, the dock slips were empty and no boats were tied up to them. So I decided to walk out on the piers and I and included walking down the four inch beam going out over the water. So I outstretched my arms to get be- better balance and slowly and carefully one foot in front of the other walked out on the beams. And I kept my eyes down at my feet, but I could see from my peripheral vision these eerie protruding seaweed fingers coming up all the way from the lurky murky surface of the water to my sides and there was lots of seaweed and i really don't like seaweed it's it's gross it freaks me out so but thankfully i never fell in i made it all the way to the end and back safely and i did it again on another one just because i enjoyed the thrill of it And I think about this balance walk on those beams when I read today's Bible verses because you have to keep your eyes on your own feet. Imagine if I hadn't. Imagine if I was distracted by somebody else in their walk across their own beam. And if I was looking over at them, giving them advice, or wondering if they were doing it right, what would have happened? I would have fallen in. I would have stumbled. 
I would have, you could say, walked, fell on into that hellish seaweed water, right? I would have stumbled, maybe lost my faith, like in our today's gospel lesson. Or to take the analogy further, maybe if somebody else, like my children, were walking, for example, on the beams and I was trying to give them directions or tell them they're doing it wrong, or heaven forbid I purposely put a stumbling block in their way so that they fell in, lost their faith, then it would be better for me if a great stone were hung around my neck and I was thrown into the sea. Do not cause these little ones, these new believers in their faith, to lose their faith because of you think you need to interfere with them, with their walk. And when Jesus says if your hand or foot or eye causes you to sin and stumble and lose faith and cut it off, as one theologian explains the meaning of that, he says, Jesus is not making a rule that directs Christians to literally amputate, amputate parts of their body. The metaphor shows the audience how serious the question of sin is. Disciples would rather undergo amputation than turn away from Jesus. So what sins or things distract us from following Jesus and walking with Jesus in our everyday today lives? Is there something that causes you to stumble or lose faith? If so, take some serious steps to lessen that problem or take some serious steps to get rid of that source of that temptation entirely. And is there any chance as well that you might be distracted or analyzing somebody else's progress in their faith walk? Don't worry if they have a different method of trying to be Christian. Do not stop them from serving or taking steps in their faith because they aren't following your way. We need to collaborate to help each other, to give each other a cool cup of water to drink, like Jesus said, to be peaceful. And then Jesus goes on about this salt thing. It should be a salty faith walk. What does that mean? Well, again, going to the commentaries, because I don't really know, this one, this one commentary said this. Disciples whose lives are not characterized by lowly service or openness to Christians who are different or caring for those who are young in faith or rigorous self-discipline, those disciples are flavorless salt. They've lost the sharpness which sets them apart from their environment and which constitutes their usefulness. So, do you really want to help others in their faith walk? I suggest don't point out their flaws. Don't be distracted that way. Perhaps let Jesus do that part. Instead, Encourage them. Give them a cool cup of water. Help them with their needs and their journey. Don't cause them to stumble or lose faith. You could help them by doing the best you can, too, in your own, focusing on your own walk as well, in your own spiritual practices, too. Keep going through the trials, through the fire, through the salt that might sting, but be at peace with one another. Today's scripture text is telling us to examine the quality of our own discipleship, but be reminded that we as Christians have obligations to help each other as well. In our faith walks, we are not alone. There are other people on this walk. You have each other. And we are to keep peace with each other and to collaborate with each other. And the really good news is that Jesus is also on this faith walk. Jesus is holding our hand, giving us faith to keep walking. Jesus gives us the reason to get up and go. Jesus gives us the guidance we need to walk. And in the work we do on this earth, Jesus gives us the energy and the power in his name to walk and serve faithfully as to his disciples. So peace be with you in your heart and in your home and in your congregation and communities. Amen.
Would you please rise as we confess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven, and he ascended at the right hand of the Father, and he will come and judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. We are made children and heirs of God's promise. We pray for the church, the world, and all in need. We pray for the church and its ministry. Sustain all members of the body of Christ in lives of prayer, service, and worship. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for natural wonders of your creation. Restore damaged forests, waterways, and natural habitats and lead us to be good stewards of what you have provided. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for those in authority. Give them wise minds and compassionate hearts. Strengthen in them a desire to protect the vulnerable and care for those underserved. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for those who are struggling with cancer, dementia, or any other disease. Provide them with peace and resilience for the days ahead. Sustain caregivers with energy and patience. We also lift up those before you on our hearts and minds, our homebound, Tony, Joyce, those preparing for surgeries, veterans, those serving in the military, victims of war and natural disasters, We also pray for those celebrating birthdays or anniversaries and others we lift up before you in the silence of our hearts at this time. Lord, in your mercy, we give thanks for all your saints, those who have loved and known and those from every time and place. Continue to guide us by their example and reassure us of your promised salvation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Gracious God, we give thanks on this 137th anniversary at St. John's Lutheran Church for your disciples worshiping and serving here. We thank you for the resources and tools you have given this congregation to do the work, including completing the mortgage for this building. We give thanks for all the generous gifts given in this place, and most of all, for the people who are welcomed and gathered here. Lord, in your mercy, receive these prayers, O God, and those in our hearts known only to you, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you today. Please share signs of peace. Let us pray. Blessed are you, O God, maker of all things. Through your goodness, you have blessed us with these gifts, ourselves, our time, and our possessions. Use us and what we have gathered in feeding the world with your love. Through the one who gave himself for us, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right to give our thanks and praise. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. Had to say that one twice today. 
In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, given and shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this in remembrance of me. And we pray as Jesus taught us, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. At this time, I invite you to take your little package of juice and a bread wafer and open that up. No rush, don't worry. If it's having a hard time, that's okay. One, raise your hand if you still need one, we'll get you one. And hold up your wafer, the body of Christ given for you. You may eat it. Open your juice. The blood of Christ shed for you. Let us pray. We give you thanks, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through the healing power of this gift of life. In your mercy, strengthen us through this gift, in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. For the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Receive this blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine on you with grace and mercy. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Go in peace, live in love as Christ loved us. Thanks Thanks be to God. You may be seated, and at this time, I do believe we have an announcement. Thank you, Pastor Sherry, for leading our service this morning. Welcome home. I can tell I'm getting old because I remember little Sherry Van Donzel at Sunday School. Here, so <laughs> come a long way. Good morning, everyone. Since I was serving as the president of the congregation and also chairman of the building team during our remodeling project here at St. John's, I've been asked to say a few words this morning. I'm guessing there probably aren't too many of you sitting on the edges of your seats going, oh boy, a speech. (laughs) But I promise to keep it as short and as painless as possible. When we first presented our plans and pricing for the new additions to the front and rear of our facility, there were concerns expressed by some of our members about our ability to pay off such a large debt. 
It was, after all, the biggest commitment that our Congress, con congregation had been asked to make since the construction of the church itself in 1971 and the economy was not in a very stable condition at the time. Given that, the concerns were reasonable and appropriate, but I for one did not share them. I thought back to all the times when our members had been asked to step forward in the past, and every time there was a need demonstrated, the faith, commitment, and generosity of our members shone through. After much discussion, the project was approved. And sure enough, here we are today, getting ready to go outside and burn the mortgage, many years ahead of the time when it was originally scheduled to be paid off. I would like to personally thank everyone who participated with donations toward the cost. You should all feel very proud and blessed today. I'd like to take just a moment here and give a special thank you to Connie April. Where's Connie? Connie, would you stand up, please? She's been watching over our financial uh, situation here as treasurer of the building fund for a long time now. I told Connie the other day that my work in the building team chairman ended as soon as the project was completed, but hers has been ongoing ever since. So thank you, Connie, for the many hours of handling donations, making payments, and renegotiating the interest rates for the last 11 years. <clears throat> More recently, we've been able to add a new state-of-the-art audiovisual system here and just this last week, we replaced the windows that were the original windows from 1971 in our facility. These newest upgrades have also been made possible by your generous donations. Uh, incidentally, while we do have enough funds in other accounts to cover the cost of these upgrades, the actual donations for them are a little short of covering the full costs. So if you happen to find an uncashed stimulus test laying around the house, or decide to cash in your piggy bank, please feel free to share that if you like. When I began thinking about what I might say today, I decided it might be a good idea to first revisit the speech that I gave in December of 2009 at the dedication service for the new facilities. As I read through it, I found some thoughts that I believe are appropriate for today as well. On that day, part of what I shared was this. Through everyone's effort, we have created a big, empty shell. Certainly a beautiful and spacious and functional one, but nonetheless a big, empty shell. I've had the opportunity to stop here many times during construction, and every time I do so, I found the same thing. The building was dark and quiet and lifeless and empty. Truly a big empty shell. But this morning again, it's something entirely different. It's bright and noisy and filled with life. For you see, just like the body is an empty shell that simply houses the truly important part of each of us, our spirit, so too our facility is a shell that houses what is really important, the people of St. John's. There's a sign on the outside of our building that proclaims it to be St. John's Church of Morgan. It would probably be a lot more appropriate if that sign were on the inside of the building where the real St. John's Church can be found right here among its members. As I read those words, they seemed especially appropriate, as I have experienced the same thing just a few short months ago when we were forced to shut down because of COVID. 
It was sad to stop in a church only to find this big, dark, empty shell. I miss seeing all the people here and getting a chance to visit with everyone. I miss the sound of the music and the opportunity to hear God's word. Oh sure, thankfully, we were able to sit at home and watch a partial service on Facebook, but I'm sure that you will agree it's just not the same. We should all thank God for and take advantage of the fact that we've been able to return to at least some type of normalcy here at St. John's. So the bottom line this morning is this. You, the members of this congregation, are St. John's, Lutheran Church of Morgan. Without you, this building is just a big empty shell. I'm sure that we didn't receive one single dollar from the windows and doors as donations. The walls didn't contribute anything to help pay off our rent. It was you and your fellow members who did that. And because of your efforts, we're able to come together today to burn the mortgage. This morning is indeed a time to celebrate that we have a great paid off tool here to help us continue God's work. But it's also a time to stop and remember why we built this structure in the first place. It's a place where all of us can meet, commune, hear God's word, and enjoy each other's fellowship. But most important, it's a place to share God's message of love and peace with everyone around us. So let's continue to do whatever we can to make sure this place is never just a big, empty shell. Thanks be to God. Good morning. I don't have much to say other than just I wanted to thank a few people that are here today in the congregation. Uh, Bert Dunst, who was our council president at the time, as well as the chairman of the building team. Mark Van Donzel, it's good to see you here today. We've missed your face for a few years. And Connie April, I mean, the work you did for 11 years was astounding. Um, and with that, everyone else that contributed, um, the work you did for the last 11 years was astounding as well. To be able to pay it off in 11 years is truly amazing. Thank you all.